Emily Short, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I am Emily Short. Um, I usually write interactive fiction and games and pieces that are uh, doing interactive narrative in some way. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you about something completely static that I wrote that you can't interact with at all. Um, but which was kind of inspired by some of my interest in interactive fiction. Um, it's a piece called Annals of the Parigues. Um, and it is a procedurally generated guidebook to a number of different towns. And this started out as a project where um, I'd actually just recently moved to England and I was amused by the wonderful place names that you have here. Um, and so I decided to make a procedural place name generator. Um, and once I'd sort of gotten started on that path, I became really interested in like, okay, well, I'm generating these place names, but there are sort of etymological considerations to the place names that I'm generating. So if I generate some place that ends in Ford, it should, I should remember that it's on a river. Like there are these sorts of things that I should be doing to sort of transform the place names. Um, I've got upper, lower, middle, what's it, and so on. Um, and it immediately sort of suggested to me that I was not just creating names of places, but I was creating kind of lots of implications about what these towns were. Um, and that grew into this project where I, was, I decided I wanted to generate little descriptions of the towns. Um, and then it became a thing where I wanted to create a whole guidebook to these different towns that would describe in detail, like, what is it like to go to this place? Um, what do they have there? building out from the name and, it, and sort of pulling in all kinds of different characteristics of what the town might be like. And as I worked on that, um, I was originally doing it, like doing that, that first place name generator was very simplistic, but I built up sort of more and more complicated grammar. Um, and it ultimately became a grammar that was uh, creating new information as it went along and then storing that information and reusing it. So for instance, um, any content in the corpus that I was pulling from um, to fill in a grammar node would be tagged with information about it. Like, you know, there's a bridge in this town would be a description that would be appropriate to go with a town that has a river in it. Um, so that would be tagged as related to a river. And when the grammar was going through and selecting new elements to go into its descriptions, um, it was allowed to select anything that didn't contradict information that was already established about that town. So if it didn't know whether there was a river yet or not, it didn't know what the landscape of the town was, it was allowed to select a river-related um, item and then pull that into the set of data that it had about the town that it was in generating. So as it was creating this description, it was actually kind of building out the underlying model and forcing that model to be consistent with anything that it generated further. Um, so how did that get from there to an actual sort of guidebook? This guidebook runs to 80 pages of generated town descriptions. Um, and that's because I would run the description of a town, um, decide whether I liked it or not. If I liked it, I would pull it out and glue it into my guidebook. Um, and then I would actually also tweak the generator a little bit. So I was evolving the content of that generator as I was going all along. Um, to make it kind of richer and more interesting and also to pick up themes that I was encountering in the generated work. Um, so this is very much kind of an iterative human and machine uh, collaborative process. Um, and I was really interested in getting to something that would be, on the one hand, still obviously a piece of generated literature. It was important to me that it not uh, conceal that fact. Um, and at the same time, I wanted it to be something that somebody might like actually sit down and read through the entirety of, um, because a lot of generated um, novels or long, um, long form generated literature is something that you kind of you enjoy dipping into, but you might not like sit down and read the whole thing. So that was my ambition: was to make something where if you did sit down and read the whole thing, it would actually be an interesting um, experience. Um, so this is an example of a town description from this. So we've got Tweedmore uh, pulling together a couple of pieces to create that town name. Um, it's got a couple of little sort of uh, meant to be kind of iconic descriptors, dank streets and gloomy afternoons. Um, sounds like a lovely place to visit. Um, the name of Tweedmore appears first in a cycle of short poems nine centuries old. The text runs to five volumes and purchasers at Estaney Sisters will be given a complimentary case in which to carry it away. The town is built at one end of a large and ancient forest. The streets are cramped and narrow, especially in the older parts of the town. So what's happened is it's got a grammar that it can expand about 
Um, you know, I start off this town description with a little bit about its history, its foundation, something about what kind of place this is. So that's what we've got in that, that first paragraph. And then I'm giving you a little bit more sort of physical information. Um, I've established, all right, the landscape is forested, so anything that comes in later is going to have to pay its respects to that. Um, and it's also decided that this is kind of a, uh, like, not super fancy town. It's, it's old, it's a bit dumpy, right? Um, excursions. The most beautiful prospect of Tweedmore is that afforded by looking over one's shoulder on departure. This is the computer being slightly rude. It's put together the most beautiful prospect and then one of several options that it had available, and I guess it didn't judge Tweedmore very highly. Uh, those accustomed to a door that locks may find themselves disappointed in Tweedmore, which affords only a tiny thatched building under the name of Fenugreek and Sponge. I had a lot of fun with the in-name generators. We were once served slug meat that was 156th, 164th gristle. Um, so here it's pulling in, you know, whatever type of meat. The many nicer types of meat are available, but because this town is poor and yucky, um, slugs are deemed to be appropriate meats to have there. Um, it has procedurally generated a fraction that no human being would ever write. Um, and then finally, it is advisable to change horses at the Pigeon Inn. It is a shabby building thanks to the poverty of the town. So we've really kind of got a consistent view, at least, of what kind of place Tweedmore might be. Um, so I'm going to talk both about uh, sort of what, how I approach this from an aesthetic point of view, and also um, sort of five things that I took away as principles about how I did it that I would like to apply to um, future work. Um, so one of the things that I did when I was setting up this project was, in addition to those tags that I was just talking about, like, this is something associated with a river, this is something associated with a mountain, this is a line that we would say about a poor town, um, I had more sort of abstract themes in mind as well. And I actually kind of approached this thinking about it like um, suits in a tarot deck. And the idea that I had here was I wanted there to feel like there was kind of an underlying conceptual consistency to these towns and the kinds of places they were and the kinds of places that could exist in the broader universe of this story um, that wouldn't necessarily be foregrounded to the player or to the reader, rather, in a way that was completely obvious. Um, so I had these, these sort of ideas that I felt were like inherent in the philosophy and aesthetics of this culture. So things that I associated with what the suit I was calling salt um, would be, you know, sort of lawful, orderly, um, non-chaotic, organized. You think of salt having a regular cubic crystalline structure um, and just, you know, it, it is a thing that dries things out. Um, and it, so it creates this, you know, kind of things that are orderly um, would be salt related. Um, and so a town could be salty, and that would mean it would be likely to um, have, you know, if, if it was procedurally choosing a color for things in that town, they would be desaturated colors. If it was choosing a building style for that town, they would be austere buildings. Um, and all those kinds of things would reflect, like, that aspect of the town. If it had, if I were talking about town religious beliefs, um, they would, it would be an organized kind of religion in a salty town. Um, whereas beeswax was associated with things that were, sort of chaotic, witchy, artisanal. You think of candle wax, you think of um, lots of bees in a hive, you think of honey being organic and warm and pleasant. Um, venom I was associated with like both hallucinogenic drugs, um, things that kill you quickly, things that are really brightly colored and beautiful. Um, mushrooms simultaneously fertile, fermenting, and decaying. If you wind up at a mushroom town, there's lots of brewing and cheese going on there. Um, and then egg as a theme for things that were simple, hierarchical, elegant, but also exclusive, right? Like the, the ego would be kind of egg related um, and the idea of somebody being in charge and everybody else being subordinate to them. And so those tags wound up going on, not absolutely all, but most of the corpora that I was using to generate these pieces, I was pulling um, out of corpora that were at least partially marked up with that kind of information so that there would be some correspondence to the style of the town overall um, that I was creating. And once I was done um, actually building this project, I also started to associate those themes with um, some of the principles of how I built it. Um, so to go through those in turn, salt we talked about as being crystalline, regular, lacking organic qualities. 
And that kind of ties into the idea of using a grammar for this kind of thing in, this, in the first place. And what is the appeal of building something like this out of a very structured um, kind of generator? It's, you know, it's not doing Markov chains. It's doing this very kind of top-down approach. Um, but what I liked about that was that the, the sort of systematic quality of it was communicating to the reader something um, about like the preoccupations of the writers of this travel guide. Um, they always give you a description. They always tell you something about lodgings, probably some advice about food, transportation. Is it easy to live there? Typically some kind of warning, often a warning about local etiquette. What is it dangerous to do here? Um, and that kind of repetition communicated something um, about the kinds of people who are supposedly writing this. And as I was working through it, um, originally in the, in the sort of the first towns that you encounter, um, there are a few references to you know, the writers of this guide. As the generator went on and as I worked with it, um, those actually started to emerge in my mind um, through this process as a couple of individual characters who were actually traveling this landscape and they started to have a little bit of personality for me. And their personality is partly a result of kind of what I read about them from the machine in a weird way. Um, so the system, as I was saying, is it's part of what we're trying to communicate um, and it sets up room for exceptions. And I'll come back to that one in a moment. Um, the concept of beeswax, incorporating many individuals into a whole, incorporating lots of different pieces, I was associated with um, some of my thinking about the corpus materials themselves that I was using. So I've talked a little bit about how this project was drawing on, um, you know, sort of descriptions of buildings, descriptions of landscape items, and those sorts of things. But there are also el other elements in it um, that were much more... Uh, sort of much larger units. Um, so when I needed to refer to something in a generated history, I would talk about like, it was so many years since such and such event happened, or um, it was shortly before this other thing occurred. A lot of, some of those events were things that I had written as an author that I wanted to kind of seed into this imagined world because I thought they were interesting. Um, but most of them were actually scraped out of um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. And so it's just a list of like deaths of kings and bishops and abbeys being founded and all of these kinds of things. Um, but there, that gave it a kind of specificity and also tied it back into that English landscape a little bit more. The other thing that, that I find kind of interesting to pull in um, as corpus elements that are sort of slightly larger than, than the usual chunks you might be thinking of um, are things that actually are allusions, proverbs, value judgments, um, sort of generalizations that might seem like folksy wisdom. And my go-to point for this is not something Anglo-Saxon at all, but uh, a work called The Characters of Theophrastus. Um, Theophrastus was a Greek author, and he wrote a book that is a series of descriptions of people who are stereotypically funny in various ways. Um, so an example of Theophrastus's um, descriptions is the unseasonable man the, his, is a person who's always doing things when it's inconvenient. Um, he, he is one who will go up to a busy person and open his heart to him. He will serenade his mistress when she has a fever. He will come to give evidence when the trial is over. He will propose a walk to those who have just come off a long journey. And when he's minded to dance, he will seize upon another person who is not yet drunk. So this man has very bad judgment. Um, but the wonderful thing about Theophrastus, aside from the fact that there are lots of, not, not just the main text itself, obviously, but actually also perfectly good translations are already long since in public domain. Um, and it's also very, um, it, it's very sort of systematically written in such a way that it's easy to scrape this and come up with a list of, you know, somebody who gives evidence, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I just pulled a whole bunch of descriptors of the sorts of things that certain types of people do. Um, and tagged them with, you know, does this th seem like a salty activity or a beeswaxy activity? Um, and put that into my generator as well. So, um, and there were some things that I had to cut out of that because some of those ideas were very like, you know, the man goes to the marketplace and has a conversation with a Spartan and clearly that's not really appropriate for what we're building. But um, there were a lot of pieces that were. And what I really loved about these elements was that there was a lot of sort of subtext in them. And they combine well with other pieces to, to create a feeling of sort of even more subtext. When you say that, you know, that, so I was using these to describe um, people who are leaders in particular towns or people who are leaders in a particular province. 
Um, and I would say, you know, this person um, has a currency in clipped coins, and he's also the kind of guy who would, um, you know, propose a walk to somebody who's just come off a long journey. And that makes him seem like miserly and inconsiderate in a way that's actually kind of productively new from those elements. Um, so obviously, you know, we talk a lot about when selecting corpus materials, being sure to edit and edit out, right? Like we talk about getting rid of what's inappropriate, modifying out offensive words, and that kind of thing. Um, but part of what this project taught me, at least, was also to really respect that the corpus itself can be a cultural product in the work of other individual people. And you can use that in a positive way. You can say, like, yes, I do want to make use of some of the cultural implications of this. Um, I do want to think about how this piece is relating me back to those people. So it's collaborating with the machine, but if I'm doing a lot of data scraping of any kind, um, then it is a collaboration with those people as well. And so thinking about that um, can kind of, it can be aesthetically productive and it can also be, is morally productive a phrase? I don't know. Um, uh, so third thing, venom, uh, striking brilliant and memorable effects. Um, so one of the things that I love about procedurally generated text um, is that it will put things together that you would not have thought of putting together yourself and that are sometimes like a bit horrifying. Um, so here's a description of dining in one of the particular towns. One cannot say one has truly enjoyed the place without trying the local specialty, spicy heart baked in a buttery crust. People around here insist on leaving at least three bites behind to indicate that one has been sated. Failure to observe this custom may result in the innkeeper providing additional servings with or without the guest's permission. So this has put together several different chunks. Like there's, there's meat in a crust is a generated food description. Um, it's chosen organ meat rather than slug meat this time because we're in a different kind of locality. And then it's going on to give us some etiquette about eating. Um, but the juxtaposition of like the innkeeper is going to keep giving you more of this dish when it's a heart rather than it's just a sort of a generic pie is like much more alarming than anything I would have come up with on my own. Um, the flip side of this is when you are dealing with material that, you know, where you're pulling in pieces that are meant to be sort of memorable and cool and they're meant to spark off each other in interesting ways, you have to be conscious of what the cadence of that is and make sure that you're distributing your surprising and unsurprising material in a good way. So this is an example that some of you I know have already seen before, but one of the things that um, the system will generate as part of the history of a town is a little description of why the town was founded where it was founded, and it will sometimes make that be, here's an oracular event that happened at the location of this town. Um, and so one of the grammars it can use to do this is a person notices an animal doing something weird, and one of the expansions for person could be a profession named blah, blah, blah. Um, an animal can be a something creature doing something weird, activity in a location, and so on. And you can see how it expands out. Um, here is the unfortunate result that, that came about at one point. Um, a goat herd named Leofric the Seditious hears the voice of a flaming mare who was defecating while standing in a shaft of moonlight on a hilltop. Now, like, there are a lot of individual pieces of this that I think would be fun, and I don't even object to the mayor doing its business as an oracle. Like, that feels sort of conventionally ancient somehow. Um, but the combination, like, you've clearly, there's no way that you have continued to picture this scene by the time you get even to about here, let alone all the way down, because you're just overloaded with, like, okay, there's a goat herd, and he's got the weird name of Leofric, and also he's seditious, so he's done something treacherous. I wonder what that was. And then he heard the voice of a mare, which is unusual, and the mare was on fire. And it's just like, the, the, like by the time you're done, you, it's just kind of exploded. It's a terrible piece of writing. It's like nobody would write that. Um, and nobody would imagine like that scene as a cool, impressive scene. So it has just gone way too far. Um, and so the problem here is something that I didn't actually solve at a procedural level, but at an authoring level of just saying like, okay, sentences in this system need to not incorporate that many potential surprising, startling bits in a single sentence. They need to, you know, there needs to be a certain amount of generic in any given sentence, and then like two surprising things, ideally. Like one surprising thing, it still feels like it's sort of a template that you're filling in. I went to the zoo and I saw a flaming mare. Um, two surprising things, 
and it gets a little bit more interesting, three or more, and it becomes difficult. And this is not like an absolutely hard and fast rule, but I found like that was a pretty good rule of thumb when I was actually building the grammar itself. And there would be ways procedurally to go back and, and enforce that rule um, at a mechanical level if one wanted to, but I wasn't really trying to do that. Um, mushroom principle is about the value of rep repetition as an aesthetic effect. Um, I can't really show you an example of this because it's basically the fact that there are 80 pages of content. Um, but I think there's something, like some of the appeal of, uh, of procedural literature for me is this sort of sense of, um, you know, I'm seeing these uh, moments of repetition, these recurring themes. It has a quality that's almost a little bit like, um, it's a little bit poetic, it's a little bit musical. Um, and so getting that, that feeling of there are elements that are coming back here and they're coming back in new contexts, um, but I'm not really trying to hide the fact that some repetition is going on. I'm not trying to hide the fact that this was made by a machine. It's fine that it was. Um, and that kind of is part of the point of what this, this story is doing. And I think what one of the things that you get out of that from a world building perspective is this sensation of, um, you know, there are elements in this story that I put in there authorially that I added to the generator um, as things that it could seed into different towns that were tagged to appear once only. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but those were things that I was creating. But they, because they were embedded in this larger space of relatively more banal possibility, it felt like they were grounded a little bit. At least I felt that that, that was the sense. Um, so finally, the egg principle. I really like incorporating cycles of machine and human iteration. Like I liked going in and adding new things to the generator and seeing what happened next and feeling like I was riffing on what it was giving me and then it, it was riffing on what I was giving back to it. And the resulting story was something that I would never have come up with on my own. It was really, um, you know, it, just, it, it was co-written in a sense. It's, it's not completely um, hyperbolic. Um, so part of that is about um, using those surprising juxtapositions to suggest things. I mean, I was saying earlier that the idea of there being distinct characters in this story was something that really kind of came about as I was thinking about, well, who are these people that are so obsessed with dining etiquette in every town they go to? Um, and kind of building around them a little bit, like, OK, who are they? And then siphoning some of those bits um, back into the story itself. Um, so adding, adding those moments of human nuance um, is something you can also do. I mentioned adding something that is meant to be a one-off feature, um, that is meant to appear only once. Um, sometimes the fun of that comes from breaking the reader's expectations. So I mentioned salt, like the, the salty principle, the systematic principle, sets up this expectation of regularity, right? Like we're going to see the same thing over and over. The reader gets that sense. Um, and uh, that means that you can kind of drop in moments as a person um, that aren't really expected. And one of the things that I did was add a one-off um, expansion for lodging that just says, don't lodge there. Um, and it, like that would not be a particularly funny joke in general, um, but just the fact that like that it comes after these like dozens of meticulous descriptions of like what in to stay at, and it's suddenly extremely alarming that, <laughs> that this is like the one and only time when they just like, don't, don't, don't do that. Um, and so people, like multiple people who've read this have cited that to me as like their favorite sentence in, in the book, but it's not like it's a funny sentence on its own, right? So, um, and similarly, uh, I had some bits where I had written, I had written a series of footnotes and the way the footnotes worked was, um, certain grammatical nodes could call out and get a footnote attached to them. Um, and once the footnote had been used, it would never be, be used again. So I wrote a series of footnotes with the certainty that the footnotes would appear scattered through the story in order, because that was part of the system. Um, but I didn't necessarily know what the footnotes would actually be attached to. Um, so here, for instance, I've got this, this sentence, which is about like trying to replicate some food that they'd eaten abroad at home. 
Um, but I didn't know what it was going to go with. And it was only when I actually ran the generator that I found out that apparently what they tried to cook at home was dried stallion meat with a toasted buckwheat loaf, which does sound like it would be pretty tough. Um, so maybe that's not surprising. Um, so I'm going to slightly spoil this book. Um, the end of the story, uh, like by the time I was getting to the last pages, like I was more and more interested in these characters. Um, and I started like putting in little bits about their personal history and sort of footnotes where one of the one of the travelers was jabbing at the other one. Um, and like the the computer had collaborated with me in a way that was that suggested that one of the characters might actually be descended from the Parigues. So this is where the, the title comes from. Um, the Parigues were a, a set of monarchs who um, had been overthrown a few generations before the time of the story. Um, and they have like their ex capital that has been ruined. That is one of the places that you can find in the journeys. Um, they have their annals that record what happened in the dynasty, which have, like people aren't allowed to read anymore. Um, so there's all of this kind of stuff. And then there was a suggestion that arose from the back and forth that one of the characters actually traveling and writing in this book um, is actually related to these like heretical, long dead, you know, bad group of people to be associated with. Um, and their, their double crescent symbol, which is like the Perigue symbol. Um, so here's a point, like at, at some point, I stopped just feeding things into the generator and I started instead taking the generated text and actually modifying it myself and riffing on it a little bit by hand. And I realized like that is in, in one sense completely cheating, um, but on the other hand, like it was nearly the end of the story. Um, <laughs> So we recommend trying the local specialty sour flagons of hop heavy barley beer. Couth manners forbid the use of a knife. That much the machine made. So of course we did use a knife. We carved shapes into the tabletop, L shapes, V shapes, cross shapes. One of us carved a double crescent and pretended it was a joke. Then she pretended it was absent mindedness. Um, so she's letting slip that she, you know, has this sort of association with these, these uh, evil long dead people. Um, and the end of this, this story is really about like these two characters, um, you know, kind of getting married in a, in a sort of um, like, we need to keep our secrets way and yet it's all being published in this book. But that's, you know, that's kind of, that's uh, the computer and I got along and that's where the story took us. So, um, so basically those, that's, those are the five principles that I wanna leave with. The idea of, that you can communicate through systems um, that it's worthwhile seeing your corpus materials, not just as a like, let me find uh, 50 words using word to vec that correspond to what I want here, but like, let me actually think about productively harvesting other culturally generated works, but like, hopefully in a respectful way. Um, Venom, like the idea of thinking about what is your cadence, what is your distribution of the surprising and the unsurprising, how much opportunity are you giving the procedural system to surprise you, um, and how much are you letting it totally overwhelm you. Um, Mushroom is about accepting and using the aesthetics of repetition, letting it show through that, that this is something procedurally generated, it's not just a human thing, um, but then not being stuck with that and, and allowing yourself, like. I claim at least is completely fine to do a procedural project in which you meddle by hand some of the time. It's okay. Fantastic. Um, we have a little time for questions. Um, I've, I've been asked, because we have a, I forgot to mention this, but we've got a, a stream viewing party going on in London. So um, oh, cool. if you okay. able to repeat any questions for the stream, okay. Right, I see. So, any questions? Um, yeah. So, um, you mentioned Robert and others are interested in um, TCGs for entertainment purposes. Yep. Uh, and the text you've, uh, you've shown are obviously entertaining on their own, but your talk for those texts is doubly entertaining. <laughs> your interpretations, your explanations, the shock you showed at the defecation. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, um, full disclosure, part of, sorry? Oh, yes, repeat the question. Okay, so the question um, is, uh, have I given any thought to using the system to actually produce the commentary on the system, which 
the questioner kindly said was as entertaining as the system itself. Um, I, I haven't thought about trying to proceduralize that. Um, I did, the, so the Annals of the Perigues PDF is 80 pages of town descriptions and uh, you know, weird bickering between the narrators, and then it's followed by um, a chunk which basically is a much expanded version of the talk I just gave. Um, and then also some example corpora. Like, so that's all kind of together as one work. So I do see the, uh, the idea of, you know, this is like the explanation of how it comes about is part of the thing. Um, making it generate that is an interesting idea. Yeah. We we did some work on this back at Goldsmiths um very recently actually. Uh, and it was inconclusive whether it actually added to people's uh interest in, in this. We we did generate ideas rather than mm. paragraphs. Um but it was too small of a study to work out whether they actually were um put up or encouraged by it. It's not just the, the process, it's the interpretation. You mentioned the mm -hmm. composition of things, that that kind of thing um could be brought out as well. Yeah, so the um the follow-up was that Goldsmiths has done some experimentation recently into um, automatically generating some commentary on how something was being produced and foregrounding the technique that went into producing it, but that the initial studies are inconclusive as to how valuable that is. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, especially when it comes into, I mean, you mentioned uh, the interpretation of juxtapositions being interesting. and. Building a, I feel like when you've got a couple of elements that have been put together that turn out to spark something for the human onlooker, um, you know, part of the clever bit is that the machine doesn't actually know that it's done that, um, and we're relying on kind of the human brain software to make the rest of the connection. Um, if we wanted to actually get the system to understand that that, that that was an interesting juxtaposition, I think we might need some additional or possibly even alternative approach. Like I could imagine something that was doing, you know, at the most low level, like a sentiment analysis on what has been produced or something along those lines or some kind of very um, simplistic emotive ca classification to look at like, okay, you know, this was not necessarily fed in, but what came out was something that we can determine belongs to one of these categories. Beyond that, it seems tricky, but I don't know. I mean, they're, it's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just interested in your description of this back and forth between you and the machine. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the, the question is um, to hear more about the dynamics of the human-machine collaboration and how large were the chunks that I was creating before I iterated and changed the grammar. Um, so something that I left out of my original explanation is that the towns are each as associated with a province. So there's a description of a province and the duke who runs that province, um, and then there are between three and six towns generated that belong to the province. And so that is the chunk that I was generating at a time. Like I would make a province, um, and it would have some set of towns in it. And sometimes the town descriptions could reference other towns that had previously been generated. Um, and then that was the point at which I looked at, you know, what I had so far and revised and, and built something new. Um, and that felt like about the right amount to me because it meant that um, from a reader's perspective, they would encounter roughly one to two pages of text, maybe two and a half, especially when you, like I also put some illustrations in, so it stretches out a little bit, but only a couple of pages of text you encounter before new grammar elements start being fed in. And so there's always, like, if you read a little more, you will start to see new pieces pretty frequently. You can't just sort of read 10 pages and not find any changing up in what it's generating. Yeah. I think it's really interesting how um, a lot of times we think about you know, the writer should generate an infinite amount of content. Mm -hmm. But here you focus on generating one piece of content, and then yeah. the system won't do it again. Yes. Uh, is there a, do you design a system like that in a different way? I've never done that before. So <laughs> I don't know, more on that. 
Uh, so, so the question is about um, what might be different about designing a system that was intended to create a one-off product rather than something that was intended to create infinite content. Um, so I think that the most obvious difference structurally is the way that this is using um, individual seeds of authored content, like the footnotes and some of, like occasionally there were province descriptions or things like do not lodge in bolt mirror, um, things that I had intentionally put in there knowing that like they couldn't ever repeat um, or that would ruin kind of the texture of the story. Like there can't be two places that are like this. Um, and that meant that I, because I knew I was doing a finite sized thing, I could create a kind of a narrative arc in that content that was not excessively constrained, but there was a certain amount of like, I know that these things are going to happen in order. I know these things are going to happen sometime, but only once. Um, that said, there were some things, there were some authored pieces that the machine never selected to use. Um, so those did not become part of the story. I created them. I thought they were interesting, but it didn't think so. So we didn't see them. Um, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so the question was, why did I select some bits to be unique and not others? And could I have made uh, larger chunk sizes that were unique? Um, I mean, some of this gets back to the fact that I really, I wanted it to still retain that feeling of procedurality. So I didn't want to have too large a piece that was unique. But there are some, I mean, the, the unique pieces range from sort of one sentence to, well, actually, I think there, there are even like some dishes of food, I think, that you only see once. Um, but the unique pieces range from those small pieces up to, there are a few province descriptions and that kind of thing where that's a one-off also. Um, but, you know, I, like it was the, the juxtaposition and that the texture of it was so, it was so important to me that I didn't want to just kind of override that. Like obviously, I, I didn't want to just sit down by myself and, and write 80 pages of an imaginary travel guide. Like, that wasn't a, the project I wanted to do. So, <laughs> at that level, yeah. Okay. Um, could we get the next speaker to come and set up? Um, but uh, while he's doing that, I just had one question from the stream that I wanted to get. Okay. Is, uh, Brian wanted to know what your favorite part, favorite thing that it generated was, or if you, if you have. Oh, uh, my favorite thing that it generated, I don't, I don't have on screen for you, so I'm not going to quote it perfectly correctly. Um, but there is a bit where... Uh, it will talk about a character who um, lives in that town, and um, one of the ways that part of the grammar that can generate that character is it it draws from a list of crimes that somebody can ha have committed in the past, um, and then it can also like sort of give a little description of how the the this incident was recorded, um, and so it generated a sentence about. Um, you know, Miss So and So in like lives in this town. Um, she came here after she fled from other invented town um, where she had been uh, exiled on charges of like lewd dancing um, and indecent public exposure. Um, and there is a very fine illustrated work that recounts the entire story with like engraved plates. And I had not like come up with the idea that, that there should be like a saucy erotica about characters from the town. That was something that just came out from the way that, that the grammar worked out. So. I wasn't coming to kick you off by the way. No, that's fine. Sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Let's thank Emily. This was really wonderful. Thank you.